Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Resilience Playbook webinar this afternoon about housing elements. This webinar is part of a series that highlights the key climate challenges and opportunities the Bay Area faces by bringing together experts and thought leaders to present on the most prevalent issues in our region. My name is Karen Rosenberg and I'm a Resilience Fellow here at Greenbelt Alliance. And I'm so excited to introduce this event because I have focused a large portion of my work over the last year on advocating to make East Bay housing elements as equitable and resilient as possible. Today, we are excited to be joined by Aaron Eckhouse. Aaron Eckhouse is the Regional Policy Manager for California YIMBY. He has worked there since 2018, supporting state, regional, and local efforts to address California's housing shortage. Aaron grew up in Iowa after his parents were forced out of the Bay Area by high housing costs and underfunded public schools. He currently lives in Oakland with his bike and cooking supplies and Mayor Jesse Aragon. Mayor Jesse Aragon is the first Latino mayor of Berkeley elected in 2016 after serving on the city council for eight years. He also serves as president of the Association of Bay Area Governments. As Berkeley's mayor, he has made addressing homelessness, affordable housing, improving infrastructure, and educational opportunities his top priorities. Before we get started on our deep dive, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Greenbelt Alliance in case this is your first time joining us. Greenbelt Alliance is an environmental nonprofit organization based in San Francisco Bay Area, and our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. We leverage our expertise in land use policy, advocacy, and regional collaboration to realize a climate resilient Bay Area. We do this by publishing original research and creating tools that guide local planners and advocates on climate adaptation issues. Today, we are leveraging our expertise in land use policy, advocacy, and regional collaboration to realize a climate resilient Bay Area. To us, this looks like communities and people thriving in the places they live, work, and play, staying safe during climate disasters, connecting with open spaces in new and powerful ways, suffering less and recovering quickly after the next wildfire, drought, or flood, all thanks to equitable solutions drawing on the powerful role of nature. We'd also like to thank our partners in presenting this webinar today, California YIMBY, Housing Action Coalition, Save the Bay, and YIMBY Action. And with that, I will pass it off to Justin. Thanks everyone. And thank you for, being here for that introduction kicking us off. Um, so hopefully some of you joined us last week where we went into detail about the environmental case for housing. This week, we wanna share how housing elements are a critical part of addressing our joint climate and housing crises. So to aid in this fight, Greenbelt Alliance has recently launched the Resilience Playbook. The playbook brings together, to get, brings together a, collection, a collection of curated strategies, resources, and toolkits from around the region to support local decision makers and community leaders as they look to accelerate the region's adaptation to climate risks. This includes policy and planning recommendations, practical template language, and innovative tools that you can use to accelerate adaptation to multiple climate risks. The policies will leverage natural and working lands as defense mechanisms to absorb floodwaters, sequester carbon, protect water supply, and provide buffers to wildfires. In tandem, we address critical issues of housing justice, a, tr a just transition away from fossil fuels towards green jobs, and environmental justice in order to ensure the outcomes of these policies prioritize the resilience of the most vulnerable communities. We hope that practitioners and activists can both use the Resilience Playbook when engaging in local planning efforts like housing element updates. So for climate, for climate and housing advocates alike, the housing element is one of the most impactful ways to tangibly address both the housing and climate crises in your community. As environmental advocates focused on conserving natural and working lands for open space, carbon sequestration and climate mitigation benefits, it's our duty to also make sure that we're doing our part as a region to build the right kind of housing in the right places. So now that I've given you this background and I hope you all take a chance to look at the Resilience Playbook, I'd love to dive into the housing element, unsurprisingly, given the title of the webinar. But first, I want to set the stage. Um, so before we dive in, as 
I think all of us in this room, I'm sure are aware, California is facing an extreme affordability crisis that is driven by the interrelated housing and climate crises. It's, it's just a fact that we're not building enough housing and we're forcing working class and low income families to live far, far away from where they work. And this continued upward pressure on the cost of housing means that Bay Area residents are finding it harder and harder to find safe, decent housing. Building more of the right housing in the right places can mitigate climate impacts and reduce housing costs and inequities. But in order to do this, we need to change the way that we build and accelerate the pace of building. The housing element is the best way to do this. So I think one of the more uh, well-known parts of this process is RENA. So, you know, this, this, this scary acronym, RHNA, which stands for the, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, which is really actually the second stage in a process the first of which is being the, the first of which being the regional housing needs determination. So that is an assessment of uh, the the total housing need for our region. And after you know once that is determined, the, the it is then that that number is then further broken down into allocations for cities and for counties. And as as cities receive these arena numbers, it is their duty to find ways to allocate this housing and make sure that this housing is to, to not to ensure that this housing is is being built. Um, and again, it, of course, it's not the responsibility of cities to do the actual building, but they can incentivize the 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 process through programs and policies, but also through zoning, which you may have heard a lot about. So on this next slide. You know, I've outlined some of the different components of the housing element. So a housing element is a chapter of the city's larger general plan, and the general, the general plan being the, the much larger blueprint for the city at large. So once the, once the city sets out on this, on this plan to, to create a housing element, uh, they have, there are several components which they, which they need to put together. The first of which is the site's inventory, which is precisely what it sounds like. It is a list of developable sites, and these can be both vacant and unvacant sites. However, if the city designates a non-vacant site, they must prove that they have good reason to believe, uh, there, there's a more technical, more technical term here that's escaping me, that the site will actually be redeveloped. So there's really a strong emphasis on making sure that the city is choosing a valid and reasonable sites and not say a parking lot of a Whole Foods, uh, which some cities may have done that will not be named. Uh, housing elements also complain, contain programs and policies which must include specific action steps that the locality will take to implement its policies and achieve its goals and objectives. Programs must also include a specific timeframe for implementation, as well as identifying the agencies or officials responsible for implementation and whenever policy, whenever, po whenever possible, identify specific measurable outcomes. So for example, they may identify a commitment to apply to certain funds uh, or the preservation of at-risk units or just simply rezoning. And finally, uh, state, law, state law now also requires affirmatively furthering fair housing, which means that the process may, must consider the impacts of segregation, both racial and ethnic, as well as income and class, and aim to create more integrated communities. State law now also requires COGS or uh, gov <laughs> governmental bodies to consider the amount of traffic generated or VMT, vehicle miles traveled, which may be a very familiar concept to those of you coming from the environmental space uh, in their distributions, which means that regions can't place housing far away from job centers in a way that would require residents to drive further and further distances to get from their homes to their jobs. And so on this next slide, I want to just highlight a couple of reasons uh, to really why the housing element is so important. So again, you know, this, this need for affirmatively, for, for affirmatively furthering fair housing, bit of a mouthful, um, is really just crucial because from an equity perspective, it is critical that we develop in areas of high opportunity. Uh, you know, this is taking, you know, even taking off my Greenbelt hat for a moment, there's, there's been studies that show that just how inequitable things can be just uh, based off of where you're born, right? There, there's your zip code is one of the, the biggest indicators of how quote unquote well you're gonna be doing in life. And it's, in, it's critical that we extend those opportunities to people of all backgrounds. But in addition to that, there is the critical climate crisis that we're, fa that we're facing. And it runs from you know, greenhouse gas emissions to water 
to, to fire. There's all these places that we're actually putting people in harm's way because of bad housing policy. And so I'm gonna run through a few of those very quickly with you right now. So for transportation, uh, this is actually, you know, probably one of the biggest hurdles that we have in our state, right? Uh, over 50% of the emissions in California actually come from our transportation. And we've actually done, especially in the Bay Area with Silicon Valley Clean Energy, there's actually been some tremendous strides in reducing our emissions by moving to clean electricity. However, transportation is just one of those things that we have not been able to, to get those numbers down quite yet. And a big part of that is because of bad housing policy in which people have been driven further and further away from where they, from where they work. And I believe there's actually a study from 2019 that showed that just between North San, North San Joaquin County and the Bay Area, there was you know, actually 9.6 million vehicle miles traveled being generated every single day. And that is just a staggering amount of emissions that, that we really cannot afford as, as a region or as a country or as a globe uh, as the climate crisis is looming. So by making meaningful strides in the housing element by doing things like reforming our parking policy, there's actually some really interesting ways in which we can start moving away from our automobile dependency and beginning to think of a greener future, especially as it surrounds our transportation needs. So the second thing that I wanted to, to bring up was water. Water, of course, being you know, very, very present on our minds as we you know, got a bit of rain at the end of December, but it seems like we're, we're still very deep into a drought. I think the, uh, the headline here is actually cribbed from a spur report that, that we collaborated on. And it's really you know, a, a very powerful sentence, I think. The Bay Area could add 2.1 million jobs, 6.8 million people, and 2.2 million homes by 2070, and still offset all this water use from this growth through modest improvements in water use efficiency and more compact land use. So it sounds crazy, right? We've got all these people already here, and we, we want to add you know, 6.8 million more people, and we're going to somehow keep that water use uh, the same. We're not going to run out of water. How, how is that possible? And the answer there is really just because multifamily housing tends to have a, a much smaller lot size per housing unit, which reduces the per capita water amount, which, and a lot of our water actually goes to outdoor landscaping. I believe roughly 10% of the state's water actually goes towards residential. And half of that is just eaten up by, by landscaping, by our lawns, by all this. And so by actually reducing the per capita water usage, by reducing the amount of water we use per person, we're actually able to do that through very, very modest changes in our housing policy. So the last one that I wanna talk about really quickly is our emissions at home and how uh, you know, the way that we build our homes can actually give us some tremendous efficiencies in the ways that we heat and cool them and produce emissions. So one thing that I actually would love to shout out really quickly is, is Bayren, which has a really interesting set, not, even, not just interesting, but you know, very uh, attractive set of incentive programs for people that are looking to, to refurbish, you know, refurbish appliances, replace their heaters and coolers. And there's, they're, they offer a tremendous amount of money for people to replace these old uh, appliances that we have. And that's the reason that they do this is because these, home, these old home appliances that are very present in a lot of the Bay Area's housing stock, which is very old, um, is very, very inefficient. And a lot of it runs on gas. And if we're actually able to, to meaningfully move people away from these older appliances, and into more efficient homes, there's actually ways that we can really do a tremendous amount in reducing our, uh, yeah. our footprint when it comes just strictly to our homes. I think it's, it's really notable, you know, something that, that's interesting to me is that wealthier Americans actually have significantly larger per capita footprints when it comes to emissions. They're actually 25% higher than those of lower income residents. And this is primarily, again, due to larger homes. And especially in affluent suburbs, these emissions can be 15 times higher than nearby, than nearby neighborhoods. So again, you know, if we're able to, to unlock our housing policy and enable this flexibility, we can really see some tremendous strides in, in, the, way, in the way that you know, us as humans are impacting the climate crisis. And just to, to wrap us up, I wanna talk about you know, these you know, two key concepts, which is one of which is that cities need to plan for even more housing than they think. So a key part of this housing element 
you know, process is, is the arena number, right? You know, a city is allocated a certain number of units and they, they must plan for it. But a lot of the times, you know, say you have a site that could, could theoretically zone for, you know, could, could theoretically have a thousand homes built on it, but a developer comes and they build a hundred units on it. So there's, there's now a 900 unit shortfall that has to be made up elsewhere in the plan. And it's, it's not really efficient for municipalities to constantly be going back and forth and rezoning and, and trying to find ways to make this work. So it just makes sense to do a jo good job from the outset and really find feasible sites that make sense that can actually accommodate the densities that we're looking for. And again, you know, the are, are immense. If, if cities are able to do a good job, really tremendous uh, impact on our climate crisis because it's not enough just to, you know, we can we can do brush, we can do fire reduction, we can try to to remove uh, fire hazard fire hazards in other ways. But if we if we continually push people into the WUI, into the wildland urban interface through bad uh, through bad housing policy, we're just not going to be able to win this. Uh, win this war against, I don't know, maybe that's a bad, uh, it's not a war, it's th this fight against climate change. So with that, I would love to close with this little uh, suggestion that you, that you learn more at resiliencePlaybook.org because, you know, in this region, we face many, 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 many challenging problems and crises. And this is something, this is just yet another one of those. And we, we have so much that we're able to do if we work really hard and do a good job with our housing elements. So with all of that, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Aaron Eckhaus, our regional, a regional policy manager at California EMB to go a little more depth on housing elements and how we've seen them play out in different cities. So I'm going to stop sharing and make sure that Aaron can share his slides. Thank you, Justin. Uh, very excited to get to uh, talk about uh, housing elements, one of my favorite topics, something that's really important and be really important this year. Um, so Justin talked a little bit already about uh, what a housing element is, the blueprint for the city to meet its housing needs. I'm gonna talk about some of the parts that I think are most important that Justin touched on while going a little more depth and then give some examples of you know, different types of cities in the process and ways to engage with them. Uh, so these are not, uh, this is not a comprehensive review of what's in a housing element. It's just some of the pieces that I think are most important to understand as advocates. So the sites inventory is where a city lays out, these are the places where we think we have adequate capacity to meet our regional housing needs allocation. And there's a number that they have to hit here. Uh, and this is really important because it's one of the things that cities can most directly be held accountable on. Uh, do you have enough zone capacity to meet not only your arena, but also to account for the fact that not all of those sites will be developed in the next eight years, and they may not be developed at the full capacity that you've zoned them for? Uh, it's a, and it's a thing where I think it's really possible for a lot of us to evaluate. You know, are, is this inventory being cited in good locations near transit, near jobs, near services, or are cities pushing it out to the periphery to polluted areas, uh, to areas that are less desirable? Uh, and are those sites good sites that are likely to be developed in the next eight year period? Uh, you know, we've seen cities do everything from uh, say, oh, we're gonna redevelop our city hall uh, with apartment buildings. And some of them are actually doing it, uh, but a lot of cities are just sticking zoning there because it's a site that they control and they know that they'll never actually have to see an apartment building go up there because it's their city hall, they're using it. The site's inventory is, I think, one of the most important pieces of the housing element, uh, and it's one where accountability is really important, but it's not the only piece. Uh, the housing element is an opportunity for cities to do a comprehensive review of their housing policies and think about what are we doing that's working well and what are we doing that is not working well and is getting in the way of us meeting our housing needs. Uh, the housing element is required to include an analysis of constraints on housing including an analysis of government constraints. What policies from that local government are a barrier to housing production, are a barrier to affordable housing, are getting in the way of where the city needs to go. Uh, so there's a really tremendous opportunity there to connect that constraints. If the city identifies something like minimum parking requirements as a constraint on housing, 
they should have a program, a policy to address that constraint. And these policies and programs don't have to just be about housing production. They are also uh, can be about tenant protection and about preservation of existing affordable housing. I wanna emphasize this is not necessarily about preserving the existing housing stock. It's about preserving specifically affordable housing and housing that is occupied by low income residents. And then all of this is needs to be viewed through the framework of affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is a requirement that's been really strengthened uh, in the housing element cycle this year compared to eight years ago. Uh, there's a much stronger requirement to take fair housing into account in terms of the distribution of housing sites. There's a uh, significant geographic disparities within many cities. Uh, so we think about Oakland, I live in North Oakland. It's a more affluent community with higher quality public resources compared to East Oakland. Uh, but historically, there's been more affordable housing production uh, in places like downtown Oakland, uh, where there may not be the same level of community resources available as in someplace like Rockridge. So this is something that we really want to make sure cities are taking into account as they plan their sites inventories and their programs and policies. They should be assessing what are the barriers to fair housing in our community, and then specifically identifying how are we going to address that what commitments are we going to make to change our policies? So throughout this, not all cities are gonna be the same for you as an advocate in terms of how you engage. And I think really there are two major types of city. So one type of city, cities with pro-housing leadership and or staff, there's an opportunity to really shape the policy process. And this is where, you know, that talk about bringing out your housing policy wish list really comes into play. Uh, you'll hear from Mayor Aguin uh, about ways to engage in the Berkeley process, which I really encourage you and any of you with ties to the Berkeley community to do. I think there's an opportunity here. We have great pro-housing leadership in Berkeley for them to, to make do the housing and leave a legacy of better pro-housing policy than the current status quo. Not every city, though, has leadership like Berkeley's. Uh, if you look at Cupertino, a uh, member of the Cupertino Planning Commission, the last time they talked about housing elements, was asking if they could build housing underground uh, as a you know, way of avoiding having to, to raise height limits. So Cupertino, I think, is a city where there's less opportunity to pursue some of these forward-thinking policy ideas like parking reform. but it's still really important to have advocates engage in a place like Cupertino uh, because we need to be holding them accountable. Um, so thinking a little more uh, about what it looks like in these two types of cities. Uh, in a city like Berkeley, you wanna be engaging as early as you can. You wanna be talking with staff and the council about your ideas so that they can work those ideas into the process and make sure that they are part of the outreach and part of uh, the, the draft uh, so they can get fully developed. Uh, again, you can do a housing policy wish list here for any kind of housing policy. So these are some of the ones that I think are like good ideas for cities to look at. Uh, ministerial approval. We see know that the discretionary permitting process for housing can be a major obstacle it can add delays, it can add uncertainty to the process that drive up costs. Uh, and sometimes we see good housing uh, proposals get rejected by cities that end up getting tied up in lawsuits. Sacramento has a really good model ordinance for this uh, where it's just staff level approval. If your proposed development meets the zoning requirements, that shouldn't have to be a discretionary approval by the city council. That should be something that staff can approve over the counter saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of money. Berkeley has already eliminated minimum parking requirements, but in most cities, this is a major driver of cost. You can add 17% uh, to the rent of an apartment when an on-site parking is required. Uh, and it moves us, a, it's going in the wrong direction in terms of where we need to be headed from an environmental perspective. Parking requirements entrench car center design in our cities. They worsen the climate crisis, they make our streets less safe, they worsen local air pollution. Uh, and this is something that cities can eliminate through the housing element process. Uh, and missing middle rezoning 
Uh, I would say generally, every housing element should include some kind of rezoning. We know that the housing and the land use status quo is not adequate to meet our housing needs, but we still see some cities that are saying, oh, we don't need to do any rezoning as part of our housing element. And to me, that just doesn't make sense. What they're effectively saying is that we're doing enough now already. Our housing policies are already adequate and that just doesn't hold water to me. Uh, we can do tenant protection policy. Cities that don't have rent control can enact rent control or stronger just cause eviction protections. Cities that already do have rent control can uh, provide assistance for tenants facing eviction so that they're not navigating that process alone. Uh, and then preservation, again, this is preservation of existing affordable housing. It's not a benefit to preserve your entire housing stock. Some of it is going to need to be replaced with new homes, with apartment buildings uh, that provide more housing. Uh, but your existing rent controlled housing, you know, it's probably a good idea not to include that in your site's inventory. Uh, there are state policies that provide protections for tenants in rent controlled housing that is being redeveloped and cities should incorporate that into their, not just into the local ordinance, but also into their permitting process. Uh, because we've seen cities where I think developers aren't necessarily aware that this is a requirement to provide replacement housing for uh, if they're demolishing existing rent controlled housing. Uh, and so you should put that in your development checklist as a city as well as having a, a rental registry is I think something that's gotten increased attention over the last couple of years. And it's a way that cities can better track evictions, uh, better enforce uh, the tenant protections they have on the books and their demolition protections on the books. These are all things you can do when you have pro-housing leadership or pro-housing staff. In a city that is nimbier and uh, doesn't want to uh, be is sort of being dragged into this by the state. Uh, accountability is really important for advocates. Um, so you want to scrutinize the sites in their inventory. You want to make sure that those sites are in parts of the city that have access to amenities and resources, uh, not concentrated near industrial zones or freeways. Uh, and uh, you want to make sure that those are viable. So, you know, Lafayette is a city where uh, I helped East Bay for Everyone and Greenbelt Alliance uh, and some other partner groups send a letter because they were planning for a lot of their housing to go on their BART parking lot. Now, the BART parking lot in Lafayette is in many ways a great place for housing. I really strongly support development of that site. However, when BART was going around to cities, planning their transit oriented development work plan and asking, hey, is your city interested in this? We wanna work with you. Lafayette was not interested in being part of that work plan. And so as a result, BART has no plans to develop that parking lot in the next decade. Uh, if BART, which is the property owner, doesn't plan to develop it, it's not a good site in the inventory. It's not something that Lafayette can count on to meet their housing needs in the next eight years. And so having that kind of local knowledge can be really valuable as we evaluate these sites inventories and make sure like, hey, this is a really popular store. There's a 10 year lease. They're not gonna redevelop this site or this site, you know, uh, it's, it's dilapidated. This would be a really good development opportunity. I do wanna point out uh, one of the great things about housing elements is we have state accountability. The state reviews the housing element. Uh, and so anytime you're dealing with one of these cities like Cupertino or Palo Alto, or Lafayette, uh, you should be keeping in mind uh, that HCD is gonna review this housing element and they need your help. Uh, they want information for you about this is not a good site. The city doesn't have an actual plan to implement this program. Uh, help them hold these cities accountable. Uh, last point on this I'll say is that accountability doesn't end after the housing element is submitted or even after it's certified. Most cities are making policy commitments in their housing elements, but they still need to actually pass the ordinance uh, to implement that commitment. And so I really encourage you to get involved in the housing element process and then to stay involved, to make sure that the commitments that cities make to improve their housing policy through the housing element are followed through on. And then last, uh, all of this is easier if you're not doing it on your own. Politics is a team sport. Uh, there's a campaign for fair housing elements that includes a number of YIMBY organizations and partners like Greenbelt Alliance. 
Uh, if you are interested, they have great resources like a calendar of housing element public hearings that you can participate in. I also encourage you to connect with your local YIMBY group. Uh, every YIMBY group I am aware of is participating in housing element advocacy. And if you have questions about where your city is in the housing element process, you can always contact your planning department and they will tell you what they can tell you what opportunities are to participate. So next we will hear from the Honorable Mayor Jesse Arguin. Um, so please take the, uh, take the stage. Well, thank you so much the Greenbelt Alliance for inviting me to talk about Berkeley's housing element process. And I just wanna make one note about Lafayette. You know, when we had the arena appeal hearing where they um, contested uh, the arena allocation, they had argued that their BART station was in a high fire severity zone and therefore they couldn't build housing even though state mandates that they should plan for transit oriented development. But I, so I just want to add that context to a point that Aaron had made. Um, I want to recognize Grace Wu, who's on the Zoom. Um, she's the principal planner for the city of Berkeley, who's leading our housing element update, and just thank her and our entire team for the work. And you know, Berkeley was an early adopter of our housing element uh, process. We launched our process in March of 2021, nearly a year ago, and much work has been done since then. And I really see this housing element process as an opportunity for Berkeley to meet our regional housing fair share, an opportunity to end exclusionary zoning and affirmatively further fair housing in our city, and to address decades of underproduction by creating sustainable transit oriented development to address our climate and housing affordability uh, crises. And so I'm gonna share a screen. I have a few um, slides I wanna run through and I'll try to do so as quickly as possible. So, um, we start our housing element process with really an update on population housing trends. And, you know, we've seen steady growth in Berkeley, 11% increase over the past 10 years. Um, our population is getting older, but we have a significant number of, of residents who are um, under the age of 50, a majority who are renters, 57% of our city um, lives in uh, renter occupied housing. And to that end, 53.5% of our city is rent burdened. They're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. That's just due to the limited supply of housing in our community. The vast majority of our housing is multifamily housing, and we are a major regional employer as well. And so that puts things into context that first and foremost, um, we, we do play a very important regional role with UC, UC Berkeley, the Berkeley Lab, um, as major regional employers in our city, there's a demand for housing to meet the needs of people that are in Berkeley now. Um, and that there is a need for more housing so that people can spend less of their income on rent and we can increase housing opportunities for people in Berkeley and regionally. And so as Aaron talked about, the regional housing needs allocation arena um, is a state mandated process to allocate regional housing need to each of the 100 one uh, cities and towns in nine Barry counties in the San Francisco Bay Area. As president of ABAG, I led the process um, to um, approve our RENA plan. We had to plan for 441,000 units during this cycle. And um, that's a nearly double um, uh, increase from the, the previous uh, RENA cycle. And in Berkeley, our um, RENA numbers uh, require that Berkeley has to plan for 8,934 units roughly close to 9,000 units. And so this chart provides information around um, uh, the, the, the difference between the fifth cycle and the sixth cycle. Fifth cycle, Berkeley had to plan for roughly 2,900 units. Now we have to plan for close to 9,000 units. That's an over 200% increase um, in, our, um, in our arena numbers, similar to many Bay Area cities um, who have to absorb a significant increase um, in their uh, arena allocations. And uh, Berkeley currently has 52,000 housing units. And so these numbers are important when I walk through the remaining slides as well. So this provides um, information on um, uh, not just how Berkeley did in meeting its arena numbers last arena cycle, but what the, what the new numbers are. As you can see, Berkeley has not done a very good job of meeting the low or moderate income arena requirements, but we have, um, 
uh, definitely exceeded our uh, arena allocation for above moderate. Um, 1,400 units were required. We, we um, permitted uh, 2,500 units um, during the cycle. So that just provides an indication of where the housing trends are and, and really what, what a focus should be as part of our housing element is addressing that lower and moderate income um, households. And these, these projects are eligible for SB 35 streamlining. So this provides some information around permitted units. Um, as you can see, the vast majority of units that have been permitted are uh, uh, five plus um, unit structures. Um, you know, uh, we have seen a steady progression of accessory dwelling units, which are the, the maroon numbers here. Um, and uh, very small numbers of missing middle or, or projects of four units or under have been permitted um, in Berkeley over the last, uh, Arena cycle. So, you know, the focus of, of our effort is not only identifying adequate sites, as Aaron had talked about, but strategies to accelerate housing production and housing equity. And so the council adopted some key principles to guide our arena work um, equity, affordability, and community benefits, public safety, transit proximity, and reducing VMT, um, design, neighborhood, and historic preservation and addressing tenant protections and anti-displacement and speculation, anti-speculation policies. And so the council had identified some rezoning strategies even before we launched the process. We said, we wanna look at prioritizing building housing in our priority development areas and in um, uh, transit rich areas, areas that have a minimum of 15 minute peak headways. But we also said that we wanna focus on missing middle housing and allowing um, multifamily housing in our single family residential neighborhoods where, the, where in some zoning districts are currently prohibitive. And so we are engaged in a number of rezoning efforts, not only looking at per council's directive around ending exclusionary zoning, allowing two, three and four units per parcel um, in some of our uh, single family residential neighborhoods. We're looking at increasing density in the area immediately around the Berkeley campus and we are also exploring rezoning opportunities in our priority development areas, San Pablo Avenue, University Avenue, the downtown are a prime candidates for, for us to rezone. Um, you know, this is just some information, I'm happy to share the slides, um, which can be made available on some of our existing housing programs. Um, Berkeley has a very robust suite of anti-displacement and affordable housing programs. We permitted 530 permanently affordable units through our inclusionary policies. Um, through the, our housing trust fund, we've been able to fund um, you know, at least 26 million. That doesn't include the bond that the city of Berkeley passed, a $135 million bond. Rent stabilization protects a vast majority of our rental units in our city. And Berkeley spends more per capita than any other city in Alameda County on addressing homelessness, close to $17 million in services this last year. This is just some information on some of our policies, tenant protection policies, affordable housing production and preservation policies, equity policies. We really do believe in the three Ps of centering our approach to addressing our housing crisis. So I just wanna share a little bit about our site inventory, which I think is something many people might be interested in. You know, we looked at identifying likely sites, pipeline projects, accessory dwelling units, and then we've been engaged with BART and looking at exploring transit-oriented development at two sites in Berkeley, the Ashby and North Berkeley BART stations. And we're really excited by the opportunity to plan for thousands of homes of these two, two sites. So based on that, looking at ADU trends, looking at the potential development envelope at our BART properties, looking at entitled projects, uh, we tried to estimate um, after we account for those housing trends, what the remaining arena is. And there's no question that we need to identify sites and potentially rezone to meet our arena targets. And so this just provides information uh, based on the preliminary capacity analysis of where the greatest concentration of, of additional housing sites are. Not surprisingly, it's, it's along some of our major corridors, but there also are opportunities in some residential neighborhoods as well. This just provides information on our fire severity zones and our inundation maps. These are factors that we have to also evaluate in our housing element process. And this is interesting, provides information on bus access and BART access. As you can see, much of Berkeley is transit rich. 
and to that end, I, I think that really um, necessitates and justifies you know, having uh, transit-oriented development, sustainable development throughout our city. And this provide, provides information on our resource-rich areas with the darkest blue being the highest resource. Not surprisingly, some of the most wealthiest um, parts of our city are the highest resource. And uh, the, the green being more mod moderate resource and yellow being low resource, which not surprisingly are in our flatlands and near our, near our campus. Um, and I think this is important to take into consideration as we're looking at crafting policies to affirmatively further fair housing. So, you know, we are looking at how we can meet our, um, our need. And this, this provides information around likely sites are in red. Um, pipeline sites are in yellow and likely sites are in green. And these, sites will, these slides will be relevant um, as I walk through um, our inventory capacity as quickly as I can. Um, and so the blue represents our arena and our preliminary site inventory capacity shows that we can significantly exceed our arena just through um, our analysis of available zoning and housing opportunities in our city. And my goal is that we should significantly exceed our arena. This presents a unprecedented opportunity for us to increase the amount of housing in our city to address our existing need and our future need. And so to that end, you know, we are studying a significantly higher footprint um, of housing than may be needed just to meet our arena requirements. Um, and, and, and this slide is very illustrative and it shows um, sort of what we're studying in our EIR or our housing element. Um, we, when you add on the additional housing that we are studying as part of our housing element, that's 18,600 new units of housing in Berkeley or a 35% increase beyond what is currently exists in the city of Berkeley. That's a significant opportunity. That reflects at least 1,200 units at our BART, BART sites, it could be more. Um, units that could be accommodated through missing middle housing, 770 units, and 1,000 units through our south side rezoning um, to accommodate more housing close to campus. An additional element of our housing element process is work around objective standards um, that we are also moving forward, not just for missing middle projects, but for larger multifamily properties. And I think it's important to put this in context that a lot of Berkeley's built environment has a mix of building topologies, not just single family zones and our res single family homes in our residential neighborhoods, but multi-unit projects, uh, fourplex projects. And so um, it's in that context that we are looking at, um, at rezoning. There's just a little bit about our, our engagement process. We're doing extensive engagement through our website, stakeholder interviews, small group meetings, surveys, public workshops, meeting with our boards and commissions. And not surprisingly, some of the challenges that we've heard um, from the public are homelessness being first and foremost, the high cost of home ownership and high rental costs. And so, um, you know, this feedback has been really instrumental to us as we've been working to craft our policies and our rezoning strategies. So this is just a little bit about a whole lot of concurrent planning work that's underway. We're not just doing the housing element, we're updating our zoning near campus, we're planning at our BART stations, we're updating our citywide affordable housing requirements, we're doing a new specific plan for San Pablo, and we're updating our zoning ordinance, a lot for our very small planning department. And this just provides an, some information on our process to date, it, indicating some of the key public outreach components. So we encourage if you're in Berkeley or just interested in following our process to get involved, please go to cityofberkeley.info forward slash housing element. And we're really excited by the opportunity this presents, not just for Berkeley to address our housing needs, but to demonstrate regional and statewide leadership. So thank you for having me. Look forward to your questions. Thank you so much to, uh, to the mayor and to Aaron for such incredible informative uh, presentations. So I th we will now be moving to the Q&A. So just a friendly reminder to everyone for people who I'm sure have many great questions to ask, use the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom window. And just to, to bring us right in, this question was asked pretty early on. So and I think Aaron you might be able to take this one. So Stephanie asks, many cities seem hesitant to build denser housing because people, people don't want it. And indeed, many single home residents have a very bad perception of multifamily housing coming near them. What role does marketing play? And are there examples of cities that are doing a good job promoting more climate friendly housing? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, 
a political process. So the, the way we talk about it and the way we bring people along is always gonna be really important. Uh, I think it's important to talk about this, not just in the perspective of buildings, but uh, and I certainly fall into this, right? But from the perspective of people, this is, this is, you know, it's not that we care so much about fourplexes as a structure, it's that that's providing an opportunity for four families to have a home in our community in a place that previously might have provided a home for only one family. Uh, and so the, the people who have opportunities to be our neighbors and to live in our communities when we build more housing uh, are tremendously important. I also think we see a situation repeatedly where the idea of change and the idea of apartment buildings is so much scarier than the reality. Uh, and I think we saw this with ADUs uh, where now that they are being built in backyards across California, I think most people are maybe not even aware, uh, but also people really love the opportunities that those provide. Uh, and I think we will see that with duplexes now that SB9 has passed. Uh, it's really easy to scaremonger about the idea of a duplex, but as someone who has lived in and next door to duplexes, uh, the reality is not very scary. Uh, and so there I think is a place where it's important to have political leadership. Uh, I think people on city council need to recognize that uh, if, they, if they stay strong, that they commit to embracing the best values of their community, which are welcoming values uh, and creating more opportunities for people to live there, that once that plays out, I think people will like the, the future. Thanks, Aaron. I have a, the next question is for Mayor Aragin. Uh, you were actually an early signer of our playbook pledge, pledging for a more climate resilient future. How are you making that housing climate connection for your constituents? Well, I mean, I think it's abundantly clear, um, you know, with orange skies that we've experienced with rising sea levels, um, you know, Berkeley is on the wildland urban interface. We face extreme threat of urban wildfire risk. And then also, um, you know, just increasing homelessness. I mean, you know, a lot of our major commercial corridors, you see people living in tents in extreme poverty. And I think everyone recognizes that the status quo is not working. Some are protective of the status quo. So change is hard. But I think our responsibility is to advocate for bold change for our region, to create a more equitable, sustainable future. And so there's no question that building housing close to transit reduces VMT um, and, um, you know, not only just in Berkeley, but also regionally. And so that's really been the focal point of not just Berkeley's existing land use policies, but the work that we're doing. And um, really trying to tie resilience as part of the broader effort around um, TOD, because by building TOD, you are creating a much more resilient community, not just resilient in terms of how people go to and from work and how they live, but also mitigating the extreme climate risks that we all face in our region. Thank you. So one more, another question for Aaron. Uh, this is may maybe a more tactical question and may potentially a, a budding volunteer. A question from Lisa. It sounds like a lot of work to go through the full site inventory. Are there shortcuts or strategies that you recommend? Would you start with the highest number of units, split the list among different volunteers? Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I know Lisa. Lisa's a, a great volunteer already. Um, so. I think, yeah, uh, especially in a larger city, I know this is in Fremont, so uh, the, with the larger cities, the sites inventories can be quite large and definitely a situation where teamwork makes the dream work. Uh, I encourage cities to put their sites inventories out in formats that lend themselves to analysis, uh, including a spreadsheet. We've seen some that do just a PDF list, and that is the worst format um, so, you know, if you can put the maps out already, that's great. If you can put a spreadsheet, it allows, uh, there are uh, volunteers who can run that through uh, some data analysis to look at like uh, the maps that Mayor Aragin shared about the, the opportunity areas, uh, high and highest resource uh, to analyze how many of the sites are in that. That sort of broad spectrum analysis is really good. But then, yeah, I think ideally you're going to want to have a team of people working on this. Uh, you can split sites up. I think prioritizing the largest sites 
with the most capacity makes sense. Uh, but I do think also you want to be able to get a big picture analysis of the site's inventory as well, right? Like which part of the cities are they concentrated in? Which part of the city uh, are there not very many sites in? And could we add sites in that area? Because um, you want both the individual sites analysis and also to be able to see the patterns. Awesome. And yeah, for, for folks that are excited to get involved, you know, I think I saw the link for our climate resilience pledge in the chat. Uh, you know, feel free to, to click it and, and join the, the pledge for a more climate resilient future. So another question for Mayor Aragin from Anonymous. Berkeley recently passed an affordable housing ordinance. How will this factor into the housing element and why are affordable housing elements important? And I think we can even zoom out of it and just talk about the importance of affordable housing writ large. Certainly. Well, I mean, as I, as I noted in the beginning of my presentation, where we have been lacking as a community is in our production of affordable housing. And that's not only due to just limited resources, but land. And so things like an affordable housing overlay, which Berkeley did vote to advance and it's being folded into our housing element conversation and our rezoning work is extremely important because how can we use land use and rezoning to incentivize the production of affordable housing? We have inclusionary zoning policies, but we need to think outside the box and be more creative. And so um, I'm actually quite excited by this. I think this could help us achieve uh, more production of affordable housing by streamlining production um, and um, you know, up zoning certain parts of our city to accommodate affordable housing where affordable housing or multifamily housing has been excluded or banned ex explicitly. And um, I think that makes a big difference because the more you can increase availability of land and resources, that's how we're gonna get the affordable housing increase as well as reducing the cost of production, which we know is a huge part of it. So. Um, I think affordable housing and preserving existing affordable housing is going to be a key part of our housing element process in Berkeley, and I think needs to be a key part of any housing element process in the Bay Area. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one more question. So we are, it is, we're running low on time, so I'm going to try to do one more question for each, for each of us, and then I will start wrapping us up. So Aaron, uh, the last question for you, this is another one from Stephanie, and she asked, missing middle. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that concept and what can what can help make missing middle missing middle happen more? Yeah, so it's a term that gets used sometimes in two different ways, but the way I'm thinking about it is uh, there's sort of this middle range of housing types that are intermediate in scale between a detached single house and a full mid-rise apartment block. And I love mid-rise apartment blocks. I think they have a critical role to play in addressing our housing needs. Uh, but it's also, there's this whole range of housing types from duplexes, fourplexes, townhomes, courtyard apartments, bungalow courts uh, that used to be uh, built abundantly in our cities. I mean, I live in North Oakland. We used to live in South Berkeley. I walk around my neighborhood. It is full of this scale of housing. Uh, and it's great. I think people love neighborhoods with this mix of housing types. But about 50 years ago, uh, cities largely outlawed their construction through restrictive zoning ordinances. Uh, they would implement you know, single family only zoning requirements, setback requirements, parking requirements, lot coverage requirements, all these series of rules that effectively banned what had previously been uh, some of the most naturally affordable housing in the city. And so we went a whole, generation without uh, this housing being built. And we've suffered for it uh, as a community. We're missing a whole generation of what could be naturally affordable housing that fits in beautifully to our neighborhoods uh, and I currently live in. So uh, I, would, I would like more homes like the one that I live in to be legal to build again. I think that's one of the, the best things cities can do is change their zoning and their other rules to make it possible to build this housing type again. And let's see what the modern vernacular housing uh, for our community looks like. Thank you, Aaron. And the final, the final question to close this out uh, for Mayor Aragin. So my, the question is, do you have any advice to people who live in a city that may not be as proactive as Berkeley, that may not be as, as housing and climate friendly as you are? What, is, what, what would you say to residents who wanna get involved but aren't as 
optimistic about their their leadership? Well, I have several things. I think Aaron touched on this in his presentation. Well, first of all, elections do matter. Who you elect makes a huge difference in shaping the policies and the future of your communities. So get involved and perhaps run for office yourself, um, but also um, pay close attention to the housing element process that's happening in your community. Um, and there are ways to provide your input, but also um, if the housing element that your jurisdiction is adopting is not compliant or um, does not meet statutory requirements, there are ways to raise those issues at the statewide level. We've seen in Southern California, um, HCD rejecting housing elements, taking legal action against cities that have been playing shell games around, you know, designating sites that aren't real sites. So I think the public has just as important of an accountability role um, to play in this process. And, you know, please do get involved. And one last couple of last things I saw there's a question about trees and parks. Yes, it's important that we build more housing, but we also have to plan for where we're going to have open space. Um, and I think things like open space requirements do matter, but in a, so long that they don't prevent new housing from being built so that we have a balance of open space and trees while we're also being, building more densely. And around the tax base, that was a question for Robert Wood, building more housing creates more taxes, creates property taxes. So there's no question adding housing supply in your community will actually also ultimately increase your tax base through commercial or residential development. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that very thorough answer. Um, and thank you again to, to both Aaron and to Mayor Aragin for, for joining us today, as well as to our audience for taking time out of your Tuesday, Tuesday evening to, to learn more about housing elements. And finally, thank you to Karen for kicking us off. Um, great, just, it was, it was really lovely to, to have this time with all of you and talk about housing elements and the implications on our climate. So finally, I, would like to do a quick shout out to our upcoming uh, our upcoming webinar. Our, our Resilience Playbook webinar series will be continuing on March 22nd, where we will be discussing housing and wildfires. And finally, the final, you know, truly finally, um, the work that we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and working lands while also creating thriving communities is made possible by you. So please donate today if able, and which you can do securely on our website at give.greenbelt.org slash donate. And as you leave the webinar, you will see a survey. Please fill, take the time to fill that out as it will help us, it will help inform us as we craft these webinars and making sure that they provide the information that the community is looking for and just have better programming. So thank you again to everyone for taking the time and have a great rest of your evenings.